Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, An Insider's Look, How One Parameter Can Optimize Key Phases of Bioprocessing Workflows. I am Sabrina Lemus of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Advanced Instruments. For more information about our sponsor, please visit their site at aicompanies.com. Now, let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window. Report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. I'd like to now introduce our presenters, Tara Barrera, Director of CMC Operations at Gemini Therapeutics, and Christina Wright, Application Scientist at Advanced Instruments. For a complete biography on our presenters, please visit the bi Biography tab at the top of your screen. Tara and Christina, you may now begin your presentations. Welcome. Thank you so much, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Christina Wright. I'm from Advanced Instruments. Um, and I wanted to just kind of give an overall preview of what we'll be discussing today before we jump into all the exciting information we have to share. So what we'd really like to discuss is how one single parameter, in this case, osmolality, can be key to optimization of multiple phases of your bioprocessing workflows. So let's just take a quick look at the agenda for today. So first, um, I'll get a little bit of background information, including what osmolality is as a test. I'd also like to get more information from Tara and her background in the biotech world. Then we'll look at osmolality across different functional areas, which I'm really excited about. Um, Tara, Tara is going to have a series of vignettes, kind of some anecdotal evidence of how osmolality testing has come into play in her experiences. And you can see that there's uh, quite a few different areas that we're gonna touch upon. So hopefully one, if not all of those areas will resonate with our audience today. And then lastly, we'll talk about how advanced instruments can help. What is it that we can offer to make sure that this test is as robust and effective and efficient as you need. So with that being said, um, Tara, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a little bit of some background on yourself and kind of how how you came to be, I guess, in this position to speak about osmolality testing. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for inviting me to chat today and thank you everyone for being here today. My name is Tara Barrera. Over the last 15 years in biopharma and in the industry, I've had the pleasure of working across all areas of the CMC value chain from quality to early development to late stage manufacturing. Uh, my background, um, my degrees are in chemical engineering and I spent many of my early years in the industry on the, in the cell culture suite focused on development and scale up of processes. So I'm kind of a bioreactor jockey. Uh, these days I have a much broader role as the director of CMC operations managing early and late stage products and programs for a biotech startup in the Cambridge, Massachusetts area. All right, thank you so much, Tara, for that information. Um, like I mentioned, before we kind of jump into the meat of our webinar and our conversation today, I, I didn't want to kind of bypass what exactly osmolality is and why it's relevant in this world of bioprocessing. So let's just go back to some of the fundamentals. Um, osmolality is actually a colligative property of any liquid solution. So anytime you have the introduction of solutes into a liquid solvent, that resulting solution is obviously going to differ from your initial solvent in many, many ways. Osmolality is one of those ways, and it's really a way to measure concentration. So it represents the total number of solutes in a solution. It's expressed as osmol of, that, of your total solute um, per kilogram of solvent. Typically, we'll see it as milliosmoles per kilogram of water. 
um, that's how it would be represented. Because osmolality is not dependent on the volume of your solution, it's not affected by a change in the temperature of that solution, which becomes pretty relevant and kind of unique as an analytical measurement throughout bioprocessing. Um, and that's something that when we talk about osmolarity versus osmolality also sets those two properties apart. With that being said, let's talk about some of the functional areas that Tara and I will be discussing today in particular. So the first is going to be an upstream. We'll talk about how osmolality shapes upstream feed strategies. Um, additionally, for upstream, we'll talk a little bit about osmolality in media formulation development. We'll also talk about formulation development when it comes to your drug substances, um, even apart from the upstream part of the process. And last, but certainly, certainly not least, we will talk about osmolality as a measurement in stability and stability study. All right. So let's get started with um, some conversation about upstream processing. And I really, Tara, I'm interested to know more about osmolality and its role across development areas today in general. Thanks, Christina. Uh, yeah, so I think osmolality is one of those ubiquitous measurements that present across all areas of development. And, and we can't really say that for a lot of other analytics. Uh, so it's interesting how it comes into play. And I'm excited to talk about some of the places I've used it in the past and some of the unlikely places we've used it to help better understand our processes. Um, you know, it certainly is an underrated parameter, um, but I think it's important, especially in upstream culture, because it's very reliable in terms of measurement. Awesome. So. I'm glad that you mentioned that. Let's go ahead and, like I said, just kind of jump into upstream. Can you tell me a little bit more about where you would typically see osmolality testing in upstream development? Absolutely. As many of you might know, cell culture is still a little bit of a black box. It's a mix of science and superstition. Um, any cell culture scientist will attest to this. We all have our favorite laminar flow hoods, our best culturing days. The real challenge in cell culture is that we have minimal benchtop analytics, and it's a very dynamic process to try to keep under control. We're typically using about a dozen or so parameters to characterize what's going on in the bioreactors and use that to make assumptions on the health and productivity of the culture. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. So I know you've had about 15 years at this point of experience in upstream. Um, would you be able to list some of those parameters? I know you said there's quite a few, but um, <laughs> maybe if you could list some of the current parameters for us. All right, quiz time. Uh, we've got pH, <laughs> <laughs> dissolved oxygen, dissolved CO2, glucose, lactate, glutamine, glutamate, ammonia and calcium, um, and of course, osmo. And then of course, we have cell density and viability or OD, depending on what kind of culture you're running. Okay, so I ran out of fingers. That sounds like quite a few. <laughs> it does. You would think that, but it's really not, right? We still don't have a great real-time protein assay for products outside of maybe an IgG. And it's really, that's the whole point of culture is to make your product. So we use these 12 or so parameters as surrogate for hundreds of cellular processes that go into making a protein. And that's why it feels like a place where sometimes art meets science. Okay. So can we dive a little bit deeper into where osmolality would come into play. Absolutely. So I see osmolality as one of the few measurements we have in cell culture that's multifactorial. It gives us a glimpse into the parameters we can't measure. And what do I mean by multifactorial? Well, as you described earlier in how osmolality works, it takes the solution as a whole and it's not temperature dependent. So it's, it's really a way that we can see all of the solutes in the solution without seeing them individually. When a development science is fleshing out a feed strategy for a process, we can use things like glucose uptake, lactate production, and lactate consumption, and osmolality to see if we're hitting that sweet spot for feeding the cells. Nice, okay, so what, as far as output or as you're tracking these studies, what does that look like typically? 
I'm glad you asked. I happened to bring some data with me today. Wonderful. All right. So what I'm showing here are Osmo traces and protein titer across a 14-day culture. Bench top analytics, like I mentioned, are still a little light in the cell culture arena. So by looking at a multivariate parameter like Osmo, you're taking into account all the ions in solution. We understand how our cells are responding to the feeds and how they're utilizing all the nutrients within those feeds without having to measure each nutrient individually. We can't get a really granular account, but rather a 100-foot view. As you can see, across the final day of culture, the osmolality stands anywhere from 400 to 500, depending on the feed condition. And it looks like this condition in light blue is commensurate with the best production. You can see in the tighter graph on the right, the light blue line is the one that's highest. <laughs> If we go to the next slide, I've got a couple more graphs um, to see how we can compare it to some of our other analytics. The challenge with the glucose and lactate parameters that I'm showing you here is that they're univariate. It's only telling us the glucose that's in solution and the lactate that's in solution as a surrogate marker for the rest of the cellular metabolism. And we see a pretty large spread across the values in glucose and then a smaller spread across the lactate values which is to be expected, but isn't necessarily guiding us to the same conclusions that the osmolality did. And we wouldn't be able to zero in maybe on a singular feed strategy here because I probably would have discounted a feed strategy that resulted in early glucose accumulation, which is okay. what we're seeing with the light blue line on the glucose graph. Right, awesome, okay. That's really, really helpful. Thank you for um, providing us with some data to kind of back up back up the story there. So that is certainly um, a really intriguing use case and, and kind of application for osmolality testing. Um, the other area that I mentioned uh, to our audience earlier was looking at the consistency of media formulations. So if we kind of jump into that area, could you tell us a little bit about how you can use osmolality as a, as a quality indicator for cell culture media and for feed formulations. Sure. Many media and feeds come to us as a powder ready to be hydrated for use in our processes. And these modern formulations, unlike those in the past, are just are generally just a few steps. And there's not really a lot of granularity into the formulation um, because commercial media companies don't like to share the details of them. So we don't really have a great way of knowing if it was prepared correctly or if there are any issues with the lot. So one of our primary quality parameters is osmolality. Awesome, okay. So do you typically see a lot of variability in the osmolality across your lot? No, not if everything is going according to plan. Generally, the Osmo specifications on commercial media, when prepared correctly, are very accurate within the range provided from the manufacturer. And that's great for us because it means that we can have one parameter that we rely on to consistently produce batch after batch of cell culture media. Okay. So I no I'm noticing that you keep emphasizing that as long as things are prepared correctly, you know, certain conditions are true. So is there a story to this or some more that you want to share? <laughs> sure. I'm glad you caught that. About five years ago, I was working at a mid-sized company in the upstream process development department. In this particular company, we used all commercially available medias and feeds that came in powder form to ensure that when we transferred the process to our manufacturing counterparts, the powder hydration process would also scale up accordingly. One summer, we had a very smart intern, and I, I mean it, this kid was really bright, but a little too bright for his own good. A lot of times, he would read over our experimental plans and skip to the good parts, modify them, and execute the way he saw fit. I'll give him a lot of credit for his confidence, though. Anyway, one day, we asked him to prepare media for our 100 liter stuff and associated scale-up. So we're talking about 150 liters of media. It's not an insignificant amount of media that he has to make. The instructions for this hydration and this particular media, they tell you to fill with water, Wi-Fi or Rhodi, whatever you're using, to 80% and then add your powders and mix, add your pH adjustment and mix some more and add one last pH adjustment before filling the rest of the water because the powders 
and the pH adjustments take up some volume and it's a little bit variable. So okay. it's really important not to go to full volume right off the bat. Uh, anyway, he's, he's pretty smart and he's pretty efficient. So he decided to add the full volume of water up front. Adds all the powders, mixes, does the whole process. Gets to the final step where we take the pH and osmo to record in the lot preparation log. And once you know, his osmo comes out quite a bit lower than the acceptance criteria. Oh, no. Yeah, the 150 liters gone to waste. And he comes and lets us know that the lot failed spec, and we're trying to figure out why. We check the expiry of the powder. We check the other, other hydrated lots from the same company, from the same manufacturer, and see that they were all in spec. So we're starting to do a full differential. We're getting really concerned that there's something wrong with this media lot. Then one of our engineers notices that we have mm, a bit more than 150 liters of media in this bag. And we ask our intern, did you accidentally overfill on your QS? And as he's staring at us so confidently, he tells us he didn't have to do a QS. And we're very perplexed and ask why not? And he said it seemed like an extra step, so we added all the volume up front. <laughs> oh no. Well, I'm sure that he certainly will not forget that. And I am <laughs> pretty certain that it also will never happen again on his watch. <laughs> you bet. We made him dump that media and reformulate it that day, which he wasn't that happy about. But the point is, with the off-the-shelf media, you don't have a lot of checks and balances because you don't necessarily know what's in your powder. So Osmo is a surefire way to make sure that we're putting the right stuff in the reactors and that we're getting consistent media formulation every single time. Okay, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, and I think as we talk about formulation um i know that the area of your drug formulation um for your either your drug product your drug substance is not definitely not the same as you said is looking at something that's off the shelf um that's kind of coming coming into your area from a vendor but despite how expansive this is uh, is there any way that you could tell us a little bit about maybe in general, um, how osmolality kind of works its way into drug formulation development as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, drug formulation development is a pretty extensive area. Whew. Where to begin? Right now I'm working at a company that makes drugs for ocular dosing, and that poses some pretty significant challenges in formulation, as you can imagine. There's a lot of considerations when it comes to what's acceptable and tolerable in the eye. And I think it might be actually a better story for a different day because we don't have this kind of time, but I can tell you we're operating within a very narrow osmolality space for these ocular formulations. Okay, that's, that's really helpful to know <laughs> for sure. And I, I can completely understand um, that this is an area that kind of requires its own session, if you will, um, but that's really good insight. and. Now that you say that, Tara, um, I did want to mention to our audience today um, that Advanced Instruments recently worked with Oxford Global to hold a workshop that covers osmolality testing in formulation development, um, particularly within the vaccine field, which for obvious reasons is really booming right now. Um, but it, it's called Improving Your Biologic and Advanced Therapy Drug Formulation Strategy in a Regulated World. So I will um, make sure that we share that at, at the end of this presentation. Um, when we open up for Q&A, we'll make sure that that's available to all of you. And I would definitely invite you to check it out on demand. It actually just happened a couple of days ago. It was great. We had some really great speakers come in. Um, and some wonderful insight and information was shared during that event. So we'll put that link up, just a little plug right there. Um, but thank you again, Tara, for that information. So as I said, last but certainly not least, um, we do want to talk about the area of stability. Um, so Tara, could you talk to me a little bit about the consistency of an osmolality measurement, um, in particular, how it pertains to this area and this really critical time for testing. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, it really is one of those types of things you can rely on. 
uh, with the osmolality measurements, there's not a lot of room for analyst error. So if we get a measure, measurement that's out of spec or out of tolerance, it's pretty likely to be a rational result. And you know, instantly I can think of two examples where osmolality measurement helped us during an investigation into these out of tolerance during a stability study. Okay, so could you describe some of those? Sure, there's definitely a moment when you review data and you say, yes, there's a mistake in sample prep here somewhere. And I think a lot of scientists, a lot of formulation scientists have had this moment where you take a look at the analyst data and you say, there's no way that's a real result. And because the Osmo values are so consistent and so reliable, um, you know, this can, this can trigger an investigation. So what, is there a story there? What, what do you mean by <laughs> triggering an investigation? Absolutely. So when you get one of these errant values that ticks out like a sore thumb, uh, you know, you get that data back in your email and you immediately say, no, stop, stop the presses. We must look into this. At one company I worked for, we had a stability poll where the Osmo was significantly higher than the anticipated value. We're talking about 50 Osmo units higher. And uh, like I mentioned previously, we have a formulation um, that goes into the eye. So this, this would be this would be very serious if this were an actual value. We reached out to our internal QC team and we reviewed the value. And even under our worst degradation conditions, there, there's no way we would see osmolality of all things increase in our final drug formulation. So we launched a thorough investigation at the testing lab and revealed that the sample itself going into the osmo testing had been contaminated with a different buffer, which completely skewed our results. Now, this was nothing earth shattering and was a really easy investigation to close um, because the analytical equipment and simplicity of the test made it very clear that the reported value should have been interrogated. And not every assay has that. So it's just a simple, easy fix to something that was in the moment a very stressful result. Okay, that's, that's good. That's um, a really great example. And I know you mentioned earlier that you could think of two examples. So um, if you want to share another story. Absolutely. This one's less straightforward because it wasn't uh, an error with the Osmo value itself. Um, this is about a stability study we were running on our bulk drug substance samples. And when you run these bulk drug substance stability studies, you have these small sample vials um, that are representative of the much larger storage containers for your drug substance. In these small sample vials, what we didn't know is that there was a manufacturer's defect that made the caps on this particular lot difficult to torque. So some of the caps weren't seated properly, but not so unseated that there was a noticeable difference. So as the, the stability samples were being filled and stored, no one really noticed it. So fast forward to about three months into our stability study, where these vials have been sitting in a 25 degree C controlled chamber, and we start to see signs of evaporation. Ooh, so how did you, what kind of signs, how did you know? Well, it started out as an official investigation into a single time point because the concentration measurement on our drug substance was out of spec. According to the data, there was about a difference of 0.5 mg per mil over the specification, and, and that's pretty high. We don't generally make drugs in a closed container. At that time, we started to wonder if something was going on with the concentration assay, because you wouldn't expect there to be a measurable evaporation in a sealed vial. Like, that was right. unheard of. The testing facility provided pictures of vials, and on one or two of the pictures, we kind of noticed these skewed caps, but we couldn't tell if it was the angle of the camera, or if it was that the cap was crooked, or, or what we were seeing. And the pictures weren't really definitive and we didn't have before and after shots to compare. So it was just like a decent theory that we were seeing evaporation. Okay, so I'm thinking osmolality. Absolutely. Yes. Osmo is one of those measurements that is really beneficial, like we talked about earlier, and can pick up even small changes in solution chemistry. So what we're able to do is, as part of the investigation, 
take additional osmo samples and revealed that evaporation was likely the root cause, which would have otherwise been a lot harder to prove because we didn't have before and after pictures. Additionally, we were able to show that the actual bulk drink substance wasn't out of stack at all, and the large scale containers didn't have torquing issues and didn't have any of the torquing issues that the small scale containers did. And thankfully, our drug substance was okay. Good. So the batch was safe, right? <laughs> yeah, you can say that. Our batch is most definitely saved. Thankfully, we were able to close that investigation using the Osmo data and other analytical data and keep our drug substance on the shelf so it could be filled and used in future clinical trials. Awesome. Awesome. And I, I mean, I, I know it's not an easy thing necessarily to quantify that, but I'm assuming that means because you didn't have to, you know, start from the beginning with your study, um, that was able to save you a good amount of, of time and costs, operational costs as well. Absolutely. And I think anyone can tell you, you can't put a price on investigational drug substance. There's, there's just not enough money for the time, the effort, and the manufacturing costs that go into it. Great. Thank you so much, Tara. This is um, extremely insightful, um, I know, for me and hopefully for those of you listening. So with that, um, that kind of con concludes our, our vignette portion. Um, so we thank Tara so much. And um, what I'd like to get into now is now that we understand osmolality as a property and we understand osmolality testing as something that clearly has value in different phases of bioprocessing, I'd like to just spend a little time talking about what advanced instruments can offer you in terms of measuring osmolality. So here you can see um, our current biotech line of osmometers. We have two single sample micro osmometers, the Osmotech and our brand new Osmotech XT single sample micro osmometer. I'll, I'll get into that um, fresh new product in a second. Um, and then we also have a multi-sample micro osmometer called the Osmotech Pro. So just to give you an overview of some of the, the huge benefits of this portfolio, um, we really want to highlight the ease of use. So still very fast testing time um, that, that you're used to anywhere from 90 to 150 seconds, depending on the instrument, um, smaller sample size. So the two single sample osmometers work with 20 microliters of sample and the Osmotech Pro actually takes about 30 microliters of sample. And then a touch screen, which is now used across our biotech products. Uh, obviously that will help to optimize daily operations as well as the workflow. And also consumable packaging is now designed for clean rooms. So we keep our GMP friends in mind. Data management features. So this has been really probably one of the, the biggest driving forces behind um, our biotech portfolio is the data management and data integrity. So there's more flexibility now with data connectivity. You can push data straight to your network. Um, if you use OPC, that is an option. There's even a remote web server where you can actually go to a website, let's say on your phone um, from home and, and see what's going on with your results on your osmometer. Um, secure and efficient management of electronic data is clearly becoming more and more important. Um, so that means it's of importance to us as well. And password protection for your data security. Data compliance getting a little bit more into the integrity part and talking about 21 CFR part 11, um, or for those of you in the EU, Annex 11 compliance, we do have a lot electronic signature and we have a complete and comprehensive audit trail. And lastly, um, with the Osmotech XT, we can now test even more sample types um, so samples that may have previously been more of an issue with our technology, um, now we see the same performance and the same robustness out of uh, our instruments with these samples as we would expect from any of the other AI instruments. So 
Um, with the XT, you can now run up to 4,000 milliosmoles per kilogram. And also you have the ability to freeze more viscous and, and kind of complex samples, if you will. Um, and I actually, Tara, since you're here, I would love to kind of hear a little bit about your experience with osmometers in general with these freezing point instruments, um, some advanced instruments. I know that you are a user. Um, could you just speak for a second to the robustness of the instrument and the reliability? I know that you mentioned that earlier during one of your stories. Uh, absolutely. I do have one question first. Did you make your buzzing go away? <laughs> That would be amazing. Um, you know, the buzzes are all a little bit different. So <laughs> it's, it's a little quieter. There's some knocking okay. on these particular instruments. I know we have some buzzing on other instruments. It's still there. Um, it's still a critical, a critical part of the, the freezing point measurement and the technology, but great question. <laughs> uh, for those that aren't as familiar with the freezing point technology, it's, it's certainly, a more accurate technology. I, I am a chemical engineer by training, so I love doing the back of the napkin osmo calculation as much as the next person. Um, but really having an accurate freezing point osmo is super helpful. Uh, it's just that you have to freeze it. So these uh, these small, you know, compressors and, and instruments that are used to freeze it, they, they kind of have a loud noise, an unexpected loud noise for those of you who haven't used them. But as Christina said, these and I've said many, many times, these, these instruments are very robust and really break down. Maintenance is super simple and the reagent is inexpensive. It's, it's really a development scientist dream when it comes to equipment that you have to maintain yourself. Um, I remember back when I was at Pfizer, I think we had what must have been one of the original machines. I mean, it was a real workhorse in the development lab. It, it took up it took up about like, I don't know, probably a third of a lab bench. And it, it had these trays that would run uh, like 12 samples at a time. And you could load it up with like four or five trays. And we would process dozens upon dozens of samples a day and, and rarely had any failures. Um, and, and then, you know, in my current role, um, putting on my quality hat, I love that we have the 21 part 11 CFR compliance and the audit trail capabilities with the newer machines, because that's really made a difference in the GMP suite so that we can collect this data in the development lab and then also compare it to our GMP scale up, which is really important when we're trying to get a product into the clinic. Awesome. That's great feedback. So thank you. I definitely, we appreciate you sharing that. Um, and that's the goal, you know, so <laughs> ultimately, we just want to be able to keep up with and, and maybe even predict what our customers are going to need in the future. So with these instruments, they're super flexible, even if it's not something that pertains to your group right now. Um, it's likely that in, in the coming you know, year or two, it could become more and more intriguing and, and something that you end up using in the future. So thank you, Tara. All right, so outside of the instruments themselves, just wanted to hit on some service and support um, that we do offer along with our devices. So we have installation and training by manufacturer certified engineers. Um, we do offer comprehensive IQOQ validation. So, you know, making sure that you are able to get your device online faster is important to you. So it's important to us. We do offer this service to our customers as well as preventative maintenance. Um, so fully comprehensive service contracts are available to protect against any downtime and make sure that you are staying um, compliant with all of these different regulations that we've mentioned. And lastly, very fast, quick technical support. Um, so we do offer, offer um, service techs and managers that are available for you to communicate with, um, and we can get someone out to you the very next working day if you have any issues. So I mentioned the Osmotech XT, um, which is now available for pre-sale. I did just want to kind of show this off a little bit because it is new. So this is definitely a one-of-a-kind osmometer specifically designed for biotech. And again, um, meets all the needs, but really we're trying to bring in a space 
um, and a device that can keep up with different sample types because we're seeing more concentrated drug substances. Um, we're seeing a lot more viscous excipients, for example, cryopreservatives. So this has really great performance that you'd be used to, um, but now across a greater range. And like I mentioned, you can now test more complex and diverse sample types. So drug formulations, um, different compounds, cryopreservatives, any of your um, nucleic acids or, or protein therapeutics, whatever your solution, the idea here is that we can cover them all and cover them all with great performance. And again, of course, we've talked about 21 CFR part 11, still holds true with the Osmotech XT. So with that, just want to thank you again. Um, and you can see on this slide our website where you can find out more about all of our um, biotech osmometers, as well as some of the applications that we've discussed today. And with that, Tara and I would love to take any questions that you guys have. Thank you, Tara and Christina, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So the first question I see coming in, um, this person says that they do not really understand or see the correlation uh, between the cell titer and osmolarity in your graph. Um, how exactly do I have to adapt my feeding strategy to osmolarity? And then they also say, um, or feed when a certain value is reached. That's, that's a really good question. Um, and thanks for submitting that. So one of the things, um, you know, obviously the data that I presented here is a quick snapshot from all the data that we collected on that batch. Uh, there's other indicators. I think, you know, the message and the point that I would convey around using Osmo for feed strategy is, you know, you can look at glucose and lactate, and glucose is a great trigger for triggering when to feed, um, but Osmo can tell you the overall health of the cells. And, and generally with mammalian cell culture, you know, we're keeping those Osmo values between 350 and 450. And, you know, even if you're using up all of your glucose, but your Osmo is creeping up beyond that 450 range, you might want to adjust your feed strategy down. Conversely, if you're, you know, kind of stinking and dipping below the 350 range, you might want to increase your feed strategy up as, as well as looking at your other parameters that are accessible to you. Hopefully that answers the question, but I'm happy to follow up more. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, the next one I have coming in, um, as to the unexpected increase of the osmo, uh, osmality value, as what is expected, um, can result to unexpected reactions. How can we minimize those kinds of cases? I think I understand this question. So if you're, if you're asking, you know, unexpected increase in leading to unexpected reactions within, I'm guessing you're saying like within the formulation itself, or maybe unexpected, or I don't know if you're referring to unexpected human reactions, um, but I'm assuming you're talking within the formulation itself. And, and I think, you know, looking, you know, taking more data points as you're leading up into um, some, some of that, uh, you know, some of that data, so like more frequent sampling can help you before you hit a trigger point that would lead to other uh, chemical reactions within the formulation. Um, I, I think that's answering the, the question. I'm not quite sure, but I, we can follow up on that as well. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, the next one I have, um, how do freeze point osmo instruments differ from vapor pressure units? Um, and then they say, from a sample fit, data, and use perspective, not mechanical. Okay, um, I'll take that. So, great question. Um, but I do think that a lot of the differences are associated with the mechanical differences. So, um, freezing point and vapor pressure instruments, osmometers, are actually looking at different 
properties of the same solutions, right? So um, to answer your question without getting too specific, because it, it honestly will depend on the type of solution that you're working with. Um, so there are some samples for which we see, you know, very little difference. Um, and then there are some that we might see a, a greater, I guess, bias, if you would, simply because they're measuring them in different ways. Um, so what we like to really highlight, especially with the XT, uh, because the formulation area where there's really concentrated proteins, um, there's a lot of excipients like sugars and things that might kind of complicate it as far as um, the freezing method, or even something like a cryopreservative. Um, even if there are those differences, it's between the two instruments, um, with the XT we definitely offer that precision um, that you need to give you confidence that that is the correct value. So hopefully, to answer your question without kind of getting into the mechanics of it, um, it's going to depend on what you're looking at. So if you're looking at a more simple solution with one solute, probably less likely to really see any difference um, compared to something in a formulation, but I can't really give you an exact amount of unit. Um, but thank you, that's a great question. Thank you. And this one is um, geared towards Tara. Um, it says, Tara, thanks for the data on feed strategy. I'm curious if you're able to use this work to tell what's going on on based Osmo. For example, um, is a change by a certain amount indica ind indicative of a specific analyte changing? That's, a, that's also a great question. So there are theoretical Osmo values for a lot of uh, common analytes, uh, for example, you know, glucose, uh, we generally, as a rule of thumb, use five and a half um, osmo units, and for lactate, about 11. Uh, those, you know, it can vary a little bit from the calculated and the actual freezing point osmo, so, so you can use those, and you can sort of see an osmo increase and make some educated assumptions as to what's increasing or decreasing based on other measurable parameters as well, uh, so most definitely. Great, right. and we have time for a few more questions. Um, this one says, new to osmo osmality here, um, how many stability time points would you recommend for a vaccine and gene therapy product for EG, um, a three-year study? Yeah, I mean, I think osmo is certainly one of the things that you test on stability, and the stability study that you design is, is very product and program specific. I, I think generally speaking, in a three-year study, you have time points at like 0, 1, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 24, and 36 months. Um, but again, again, it depends on your formulation, uh, the impact of stability on your ability to dose in the clinic and what your degradation pathways are for your product. You may have more time points if, you're, if you have an unstable product. You may have less time points if you have a very stable product. So, it's highly variable, and Osmo is just one of those considerations, and it's usually measured at every time point because it's generally a low-volume sample. So um, it's, it's always great to be able to get that data at every time point. Thank you. Okay, we're going to wrap up with this final question. I want to remind our audience that those questions we are unable to answer today and those that come in during the on-demand period will be answered by the speaker via the email address you provided at the time of registration. So this question says, for what areas mentioned today do you suggest the XT model? So I would say, I mean, honestly, <laughs> to, not to oversimplify, but really any area um, because of its ability to kind of span the concentration range and also to look at some of those more complex or more viscous samples is appropriate for, for everything. Um, I think what we had in mind, right, in the development of this model was certainly the areas that I mentioned um, within formulation and kind of taking into consideration the, the excipients and the, the more concentrated solutions that we're starting to see in the industry. Um, you know, that could also 
come into play in downstream, um, in downstream processing. So if you're starting with more concentrated buffers and doing some inline dilution studies, um, this not only will address some of the higher concentrations, but if it's something that's a little bit more viscous, again, this instrument will be really great um, as far as compensating for that and knowing exactly uh, how to freeze that type of sample. So it could be anywhere. Um, it's just really expanding the different types of solutions that we're able to not only, you know, freeze and get our the, the technology to work with the engine, but also to do so precisely and really give you a measurement that you can be confident in. Thank you again, Tara and Christina. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone who tuned in today. And certainly, if you have more questions, please send them. We're more than happy to answer them and uh, provide feedback based on our experiences. So thank you. Yes, I, I'd like to echo that sentiment. Um, Tara, thank you so much. And um, to all those listening and in the audience today, we really appreciate it. Um, and, and like Tara said, please feel free to reach out if anything else pops into your head or if you um, have any follow-up questions. Wonderful. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and their interesting questions. Questions, again, that we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. We would like to once again thank Tara and Christina for their time today and their important research. And we would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Advanced Instruments, for underwriting today's educational webcast. You can view the webinar on demand, and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. That is all for now. Have a great day. Until next time, goodbye.